Hello, everyone. I'm Dante DiLoretto. I'm head of script and programming for Fremantle in North America. I want to uh, welcome our executive producer and director, Rupert Wyatt, star and executive producer, Justin Thoreau, co-star, Melissa George. Uh, welcome. Thank you for this uh, extraordinary uh, couple of episodes that we've just watched. And uh, in, in talking about the show that we've just seen, I thought um, we should talk a little bit about the adventure of uh, preparing for a series like this, the adventure of uh, making the show, and then uh, some of the unexpected things that happen along the way. And, and I, I think one of the, the most important things to point out right at the top is that uh, television today is fundamentally different than what it was probably 15 years ago, and uh, this was a road movie um, shot in uh, seven states in two different countries, and uh, maybe Rupert, if you could talk a little bit about what that experience is like um, uh, visualizing and, and creating the world that we saw. Sure, yeah, so <clears throat> I guess, I mean, obviously it goes without saying to an extent, but everything starts with the script. Um, so Neil's work in, in terms of the adaptation had very clearly evoked um, a landscape and a, and, a, and a sandbox in a way within which to explore this story. Um, we start in Northern California. We start in the, in the kind of <clears throat> off the grid central valley farmland. We start in a, in a kind of... Um, a stage beyond the 21st century Americana, materialism, um, opulence, land of the free. We start in a kind of isolated community and that community is a family. And the family is the Fox family, um, Ali Fox, Margot Fox and their children, Charlie and Dina. <clears throat> and they're sort of living in plain sight. Um, and from there, we take them on a journey across the the course of the season um but we start fundamentally with this john steinbeck like um romanticized quality of what it means to live off the grid what it means to live uh by your own means um <clears throat> renewable energy the notion of being free and then of course the crux of it is is they're far from free they're 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 a family on the run so um my job i guess coming into this was to work with Melissa and Justin and, and Logan and Gabriel as the family and to work closely with Neil in terms of how do we create the tone of this show. Can we yeah. talk about that for a second? Because I think one of the things that's really uh, remarkable was uh, how uh, these four uh, performers really feel like a family. And I, you know, I distinctly mm -hmm. remember that experience of, of the table read was actually the first time we got to see everyone together. and. What, what was that like for you in terms of knowing whether this was going to be a fit? Hugely successful. I think everyone came away from it recognizing that the chemistry between everybody was immense. So, yeah. you know, so much obviously of storytelling on the screen is, is casting and, and finding that, that dynamic between characters and their relationships. And that starts always with, with the actor, what they bring to the role, what they bring to their personalities and, exchanging with each other and so after that read i think everyone came away recognizing that we had a a, a, a tonal fit for this show which is a highly empathetic really interesting uh, dynamic between mother father son and daughter and add to that we sort of got to to live the experience of the family mm -hmm. and that we we obviously shot in sequence and and we had this sort of very bucolic setting that we were all extremely happy with you know um sort of shooting in outside of Los Angeles and at, at this beautiful farmhouse. And, and so that, that sort of further gelled us as sort of this sort of family unit. Then um, we got thrown into very cold water with probably some of our toughest locations, Mexicali, the desert, um, all these incredibly harsh locations, which has its own sort of galvanizing effect um, when you're shooting. So, you know, it's sort of, you quickly become fast friends um, and hopefully that translates as, as family on screen. Justin, we can't go too far without asking the obvious question. Um, this is written by a member of your family, potentially inspired by other members of your family. Uh, <laughs> what is that experience like having a little background information on, on the characters? 
it's actually, you know, if there's one virtue, you know, as you know, I mean, this wasn't a, a fait accompli. This wasn't something where I called my <laughs> uncle Paul and said, you know, like, oh, you know, hey, let's do mosquito. Co-. You actually were the one who sort of had the material and were working with Apple to, to uh, sort of mount it. And then it came to me sort of through the normal channels. But if there's a, a virtue to, um, or maybe a leg up that I have um, in the playing of the, the, of Ali Fox, it's that he is based loosely on, well, particularly my grandfather, um, maybe some ever, other uncles. Um, and I think as much as he'd probably not like to admit it, Paul himself in, in certain respects. Um, and so I had, that's sort of like this built-in um, library that I have um, of things to draw on just in creating the character. Um, and also, of course, the, the source material, which is fabulous. Um, so yeah, so it was kind of, you know, it was, wasn't as intimidating as you might think. It was pretty, um, um, I was more excitement than anything else to be able to do it. And also I've, I've sort of the, the book and the, the movie and all that has sort of lived in the periphery of my life for my, virtually my entire life. And um, so I've known this material for a long time. Um, yeah. And Melissa, when you you were uh, first reading this script, uh, what what attracted you to the role and to the character? You're obviously an, an incredible mother yourself, and you're playing a mother who is uh, uh, making some some interesting choices about um, her family and how she's raising her family. So, c- can you speak to to us about the script and what attracted you to the story and the character? Well, I well I, re- I read the script. Um, I think about five months before um, filming began, and I didn't want to do a casting for it because I loved it so much. So I was too afraid to not get the role, and so I sat with the script for five four five months, and I got to the point where um, I got a call from my new agent and by Justin by you Justin. <laughs> to say, um, where is Melissa's effing tape or something like that? Like, where is it? And I said, oh, my God, now I'm going to have to do the casting. And I was too afraid. And so I finally did the casting. And uh, the next day, I didn't get a, I didn't get told I got the role, but I got a call from Rupert, or my agent got a call from you, Rupert, saying, is Melissa fully aware just how hard and difficult this shoot will be? <laughs> and so I had to sit and reread the script and I love the character so much for many reasons. It's like a fugitive family on the run. It's like a modern day Swiss family Robinson. It's got the perspective of like these Bonnie and Clyde kind of characters, but seen by the perspective of these teenage kids. It's almost like Bonnie and Clyde with two witnesses in the car at all times. And I just had to sit and reread it again and thought, you know what, I want to take this journey. And I'd known Justin um, from Mulholland Drive from 20 years ago, saying the iconic line, this is the girl. And so I just felt like, I felt like I knew, I knew you, Justin. I felt like this is something I'd like to do. And I mean, it sounds like I had the choice. It was actually like, I wanted this part. You know, I had to like really put myself on the line to get it. And uh, you know, here we all are. You, um, fired. you, 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 uh, you, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you, you sent us the, 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 the amazing scene at the telephone um, with your parents. Um, can, mm. can you talk about that as, as a performer? Well, I had many months of this scene. It was that one scene that I liked actually more than for, for my character particularly. And I thought, I miss my parents. They live in Australia. The thought of taking a job means I'm not going to see my sons. And so all of that came out. And I did one take in that casting scene. And I just did one take. It was too sad for me to do a second. So for me, it was just everything coming out from from life, from melancholy, from so many things. And I feel like maybe sometimes when you don't rush to do something, you sit on something, you really think about it. That's probably the best tactic because it really, I felt like I was Margot for many, many months. And by doing that scene for you, Dante, was just an extension of something that I'd already lived. And my sons had called out and said, what are you doing? Because I was crying and, you know, you know, with an imaginary uh, phone call for this casting. And, and I just knew that if, if all the planets aligned, I'd be, I'd be lucky enough to be, you know, Justin Moore, Ali's Margot, really. Rupert, you very effectively created a, 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 a very comfortable set um, uh, and a, a place for people to come together and feel like family, like they'd been together for a very long time. Um, I know you work with some of uh, the key department heads um, uh, over and over again. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your process and, and, and how, how you create that um, experience on set? 
it's nice of you to say, of course, thank you. Uh, but um, I do think so much of the tone of the of, of any set is 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 really set by those in front of the camera, um, as much if not more than those behind, because we're always looking to Justin and Melissa and those guys to ultimately kind of lead the show. Um, my job, I guess, is always working as a mirror, how best to reflect back on them, um, the performances they're giving and the, thing, the thoughts that they have, and also give them a sense of what happens either side of the scenes that they're working in. Um, and so for me, working with, um, working with a crew of people that I'm very familiar with that I can really lean on and rely on is, is key because then it becomes invisible. So I work um, often with a DP called Alex Dissenhoff. He's somebody I've worked with now four or five times in the last five years. Um, we have similar sensibilities. We have similar approaches. Making films, making television is, is, a, is a war of attrition in many ways. And so you really need somebody alongside you that gets up every day and enjoys what they do and loves what they do and is, is really uh, front and center in terms of being able to achieve everything and nothing's impossible. And Alex is one of those people. He's a, he's a problem solver and he, he has a passion, which is what I have. So um, I never doubt the fact that we'll find a way through um, no matter how hard things are. And same goes um, with the production designer. I, I worked with Ethan Tobman on the first two episodes. Ram, who was our designer through the course of the show, um, stepped up and, and, and took over from Ethan after the production moved to Mexico and he he became a very singular voice in terms of the, de the design of the show and the and the palette of the show but the tone was set by Ethan um, early on in in our California setting um, and then um, Guillermo Garza our D DP that took over from Alex the same uh, for episode three I, I cannot speak these guys can speak to episode three in terms of their experience in Mexicali in the desert <laughs> Um, I was back in Ooh. Hudson editing, so uh, yeah, good for um, you. I'm so, so happy yeah. you guys. Uh, take All right, well, there uh, for a minute. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a that's uh, that's a really good point. Uh, and let's talk about you know how you deal with the un unexpected in production. So the, the production plan um, was mm. obviously this is a family Out on the, the run from the very beginning. <laughs> 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 the, the, this is a family on the run. Um, as as everyone has seen, we leave you uh, at the end of the second episode on the edge of a desert, and um, we imagine the kind of adventure that's about to um, about that's to where happen. I left you guys. Yeah, that's where that's where you left the team. Oh, yeah. um, the the, 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 desert. Bye. the intention was to uh, go to La Paz and uh, and shoot our desert sequences in La Paz, but. Um, uh, as somebody who's a native Californian, um, I am not used to seeing green rolling hills in, in Baja, <laughs> California. It, there was a super bloom um, that was unprecedented. Uh, that wasn't going to defeat us, except all the roads were flooded as well. So suddenly um, we were needing to find a new desert, and uh, that brought us to Mexicali. Oh. And uh, an incredibly challenging shoot, um, uh, regardless of, of where, uh, where we were. But um, Justin, can you talk about... What's the relevance of the show uh, today, and and uh, you know the, the, this idea of a family who's fleeing their past? There's something I, that just struck me as sort of being extraordinary about um, you know obviously we're you know the original book and the and the the movie was set in the 80s and I, we I think Neil correctly early on um, made the smart decision not only to not make it a period piece or something that um, you know, we they would add even more burdens to the production, um, but also to sort of um, create some devices that, in serializing it, gave us um, uh, an opportunity because with the series um, and the movie didn't have the advantage of this. With the series, you have such long runway and so much real estate uh, for character that he um, sort of wanted to sort of think of it as a prequel, and that. Obviously, there's huge elements of the book, and and um, and he protected the characters, particularly Ali Fox. You know, very sharp elbows to make sure that that remained intact, because you know those relationships with the family, I think, are sort of really the heart and soul of the thing. But in the making it current, um, it makes it even almost more complicated or more difficult for a family like this to live off the grid. You know, I mean, you know, this is a family that has no cell phones, obviously, um, unless someone sneaks one in, no 
television set, presumably. They don't see movies. They're they're detached from pop culture and and literally, I think, detached from the electrical grid. So to push a family like that with those kinds of ideas and that ideology um, into another country is just sort of, you know, just rife for storytelling. You know, it's for great storytelling. Mm. Um, um, so even though there is this sort of propellant, this sort of fire on their backs that's pushing them through, what I found fascinating about it was um, the ideology, you know, um, uh, that they carry with them, because obviously you don't leave your, you know, you, you bring your personalities with you wherever you go. Um, that's not bound by geography. And this is a bit of a detour, but in talking to Paul, when, um, when I was sort of really digging in on the character, I was asking him like, what, what, um, you know, what, what was the reason for writing at least the character, you know, um, um, and there were many reasons for it. One of which was, you know, this guy who is sort of almost this uber American in the vein of Hemingway or, or, or Jack London or, you know, um, or Jack Kerouac for that matter, but he's got so many opinions. I mean, there's no shortage of them in the character, but he said more interestingly to me, it was that he, at the time that he wrote the book, um, he had been uh, fascinated by um, the story of the day, which was the Jonestown massacre and how this sort of benevolent preacher um, uh, had gone from the Midwest to this sort of, sort of all-inclusive parish of, you know, um, sort of a takes all comers kind of parish to San Francisco and very progressive. And then eventually to the jungles and then eventually cut to they're all drinking cyanide lace Kool-Aid and it's a mass suicide. Um, and he said, obviously there's not a direct bright line between Jim Jones and Allie Fox. Um, but um, when someone has lashed to their, themselves to their ideology as much as Allie Fox has, there is something that starts to happen within the family that is the cult of family. The character of Dean obviously is pretty well indoctrinated, we learned in the first episode, into some of uh, these sort of homeschooled ideas that Allie has imparted on her. Um, so it's just, uh, to me, that's what was sort of the reason for doing it, which was, you know, um, how does this family sort of become this slightly ingrown fingernail, you know, as they are propelled through this world, obviously with great action and adventure and all those things, you know, but um, it's just sort of a, it's, it's insane to watch them evolve, you know, the movie itself, and I'll, I'll shut up in a second. Um, I think Peter Weir once said, you know, it's a Hollywood movie in reverse, you know, things start great um, and end badly, you know, it's usually, it's not the typical Hollywood trajectory and with a streaming, show you know or one that you know hopefully in success has multiple stories and episodes uh to tell it's just going to get really interesting i think you know i mean um because it's you know the rubber's going to hit has already hit the road in many aspects and um to see how that that wheel starts to fracture and probably come together again is going to be very interesting to watch i do feel like the fam the foxes are brainwashed by Ali's ways, you know, it's almost well, like he, well, says, he says something and we go and do it, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. The, but there's also the like power. a partnership in the, in the, I mean, it's one of the, the big changes that we made, um, you know, obviously with the character of Margo, which wasn't even called Margo in the book of the movie. Mother, mother, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, and Neil. She's an another, equal, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a partnership. So it's, they're in sync on that, you know, they're on, on, for better or worse, they'll always, and if they need to have that conversation, they'll do that apart from the children, but they never sort of together. I love the way how effortlessly <laughs> they are. Like, you know, when we're in the car and the kids are in the back looking like little frightened children and we just casually say, you know, could you pass me the bag? And you're like going into these deep like theologies well, about life and all of that. And the fact that the two of us can just work in unison. And I love the fact that the way we are together doesn't really match exactly what the foxes or the situation they're in like that's, that's quite a, a dangerous great... thing to be doing and we speak like sweetheart could you please pass me the plate mm -hmm. and that, i love that, that. That's it's just the, this... the, that's the great opportunity to introduce ah, the brainwashed children my uh, brainwashed <laughs> children <laughs> gabriel <laughs> bateman and logan polish uh, who are sitting in that back seat of that car and that that, uh, one, that, that <laughs> so particularly beautiful brilliant together. moment and they look like mom and dad are nuts or yeah i was gonna say i think i think they know a little bit more than they let on 
<laughs> yeah, they know a little bit more than they let on. I mean, that's yeah. sort of the irony, not to speak for them, but I think it is sort of the irony. They're bizarrely the adults in this family. You know, yeah, to a certain extent. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I feel like we also kind of communicate more with each other, kind of just like, are you seeing what dad is doing or just keeping everything low because we know how you guys will react to it. I don't want to speak, obviously, for for Logan and Gabriel, but, but in terms of my perception of how we were able to start with the notion of Dina having so much conflict with her dad and then that arc of recognition of they're so similar and mm. and then Gabriel and Charlie being you know in many ways idealizing the father and actually recognizing that he's that much closer to his mother um, and sort of being able to tell that story of how you know characters manifest when you have a kid that's very similar to you in many ways um, son daughter whoever and then normally what that means is there's a lot of conflict in the early years and then as they evolve and grow you get very close to them if they have those similarities it's yeah. fascinating I feel like we, I feel like we sort of we kind of grow up really fast I feel like Dina and Charlie age 10 years throughout the series <laughs> um, but I do think we do a great I think I I mean I love how the, the kids start out very mature for our age. I mean, I don't know about Charlie, but <laughs> Dina <laughs> um, starts out very like the parent in the situation. And I think one of my favorite things was, you know, I, I mean, I did get a lot of questions being like, why did she not leave? Or, um, you know, why isn't she more, you know, why didn't she stick up more for what she wants? And I think it's one of those things where she starts to realize how much her dad relies on her and she almost doesn't want to abandon that. And I thought that, mm. I mean, I started to realize that throughout the series and I was even thinking, why wouldn't I leave this situation? And it's one of those things where, you know, I think she would genuinely feel bad because she knows what her dad gets from that dynamic. And it's almost mm. like, that's how much of the parent she is in that situation. She doesn't want to mm. abandon him. Mm. Yeah, like zealots need disciples. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and provide the option for, for, for the zealot, I and also manipulate. You know, could quite possibly be a manipulation, or it's you know that Ali Fox has found that button on Dina that he knows he can press whenever he needs to. You know, mm-hmm. um, to instill guilt. I just had a moment in the second episode. I think it was the second one where Dina and I are dancing in the living room. Ali's off, you know, plotting something, and then you see our son wrapping a car in foil it's just like <laughs> like the 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 nutty perspective of the 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 two adults and the two kids but they all have something to do it's just like oh my god what a show it's like they're kind of a well-oiled machine the family you know yeah they work well yeah, and that's, no, but that's what i loved i mean one of my favorite things was you get to finally see everything that you guys have taught us put in place like you can yeah. see us using those tools mm-hmm. and you go oh crap these kids actually know how to deal in these dramatic situations just because you've (laughs) sort of schooled us on everything the school of life and that's kind of awesome I was just gonna say obviously like being as sheltered and um in the environment that they grew up in is a disadvantage almost in every field of life but they're kind of going through uh one of the only situations um where it is an advantage where they actually do have to like Logan said, put to use all of the things that they've learned and and actually not knowing what, what internet is or, or how much they're kind of missing out on just makes it easier for them to kind of trek along and uh, and survive and, and try to thrive in, in new situations, which I thought was kind of interesting. So let, let, let's talk about uh, March 15th, 2020. Um, where you, are, you, are, you are in Mexico City. Uh, you are, Justin uh, already left. Open air. You, you're Marcus. exactly. You're exactly halfway through the shoot, um, and uh, and it's a, a challenging and difficult decision for everybody to shut down production, um, to to walk away from positions. Um, but of course, with hindsight, all of us thinking that we'll be back together in eight weeks or whatever it might be. Um, what was it like coming back? Because I, I believe we're one of the first series to complete um, during the pandemic. And obviously there was a significant amount of work to come back and complete and some very specific protocols. You want to talk about that experience and, and, and what that was like? I think it was, uh, like you said, it was going to be two months and then three and four and five. And, but I don't know. I just kind of felt that we would be back. Uh, didn't, I wasn't concerned. I just knew that we would all be back together. And 
I feel like maybe Justin can, can speak to that, that the five months allowed us to sort of make changes for the better. I think every, you know, if, if productions, uh, you know, per, particularly hour long dramas on location, um, they run very hot engines, you know? So there was, a, I'm not gonna lie, there was a piece of me that was kind of relieved just because I would be able to catch my breath mm -hmm. for a second um, to, to shut down. And also we got kicked in the shins pretty hard just by the story we were telling and the, the difficulty of the locations we were shooting in, which sort of, ironically got nicer and nicer as the as we progressed but as far as coming back after um the shockingly long hiatus i think we we're all eager to get back to work but i i don't know about you guys but i was very once i mean i was nervous to come back um but once i was back and we had sort of that sealed bubble around us and we were we were sort of doing what the country ideally would have been doing you know in the in the best of circumstances which is testing everybody every day if you know, God forbid anyone would get sick that you could pull them out of the, the food chain. And, and um, so I had this incredible sense very quickly that, of feeling incredibly safe, you know? And mm -hmm. so by Same the time way. we ended, I was actually kind of not wanting to come back to New York um, where I wasn't, <laughs> didn't have that bubble, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I could have just stayed there, you know, and <laughs> kept shooting like, hey, let's just keep this going yeah. a little longer. Um, yeah. You know, it was, but it was a very liberating thing. Add to the fact that I hadn't, you know, been able to sit in the same freaking room with someone and, and have a lunch, dinner, or, or conversation, you know, so just the socializing of being on set, and it gave it this kind of purpose, you know, like, a lot of things fell away in, the, in just sort of production things, you know, um, that you realized you didn't need sort of the cacophony of a, of a working unmasked set, all of a sudden became the spaces Focused, uh, between yeah. the camera and the, and the, and the, and the scenes. Uh, became that much more intimate. And so I, I kind of really liked our COVID set, you know. Well, yeah. and it, it's important, I think, to to make everyone aware, too, that you were shooting, as you, you mentioned, the bubble, that you were actually in a in a complete quarantine with, with the entire unit, um, all of the background performers, all of the key crew, the 275 people um, in quarantine together. Um, that's um, that's an intense environment too, but 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 very focused. Gabe, was that um, was that a challenge for you? I mean, I think it kind of was at first. Obviously, you know, getting used to new protocols and new things uh, while filming can be challenging. Uh, but I think at a certain point, um, we kind of were in the same groove and same flow that we ever were, uh, almost better in a way. Actually, specifically, like with our bonds and relationship, I actually feel like. Uh, Guadalajara, which is where we came back uh, post hiatus, was almost like a second Mexicali um, in which we kind of all grew a lot closer. At a certain point, we were the only people that we could, like Justin was saying, the only people that we could really socialize with and hang out with. Um, it was kind of like on weekends and day off, uh, since everything was so shut down, you could spend the entire day in the hotel or you could go hang out with Logan and, and do something. Uh, my best memories are wrapping, so. wrapping set and then calling Logan and Gabe and saying, how long do you need? I'll see you downstairs in 10 minutes. Yeah. It's like <laughs> we, or, or, or we would go to your place, Justin, or whatever. It was just so, such a lucky um, feeling to have with some actors, which I don't think we could all say it's always like that. It's never yeah. as oh, tight and good. So and, nice. and just be like, you know, I had 15 minutes away from Logan and you guys and the minute I see it, I'm like, oh, I feel better now. You know? Like it was even when we were shooting to be in away. Los Angeles, it didn't have the same continuity because you know we were all you know Logan lived in Los Angeles, Gabriel does you know like so uh, me and Melissa were sort of living together in this little uh, that was complex, so much fun, which was, was so, so great. Fun. But but at yeah. the same time, you go back you know when you're in a city and you sort of go to a set and then come back and then go to your houses, you know it doesn't have the same you know we were essentially on. I mean, in a much more luxurious way, but we were on the same adventure that the foxes go on, just yeah. with better hotel rooms. Uh, so tell me again, let's recount the, the the cities that you shot in in Mexico. Yes. Mexicali. Mexicali, 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 Mexicali City, Puebla. Yeah, Puebla. Puebla. Mexico City. Puerto Vallarta. Puerto Guadalajara. Punta Nita. In order. Guadalajara. <laughs> Guadalajara. Punta Vallarta, Sayulita. <laughs> I just remember that uh, Acropolis shopping mall in Mexico City. That's a really interesting moment, and it's good to talk about that. Um, we're talking about in episode two, 
the homeless encampment that is in uh, uh, Stockton in the story um, you actually shot in Mexico. You want to you want to talk a little bit about that, Rupert? Yeah. So it's it, it was it was a the notion of this consumerism. What what does consumerism mean? And it's a speech that Ali gives in this location about the idea that our detritus, our, our, our cast offs, are kind of embodied in human form. And so it felt like it made a whole heap of sense to actually set it in a, a place of consumerism, in a, a, a place of materialism, i.e. a shopping mall. And we found this amazing location in Mexico City, which was once a, a shopping mall and had kind of fallen into disrepair and decay and had this crazy kind of old old sort of Grecian style. So we called it the Acropolis. I think it was called the Acropolis actually. We populated it with, um, with the kind of denizens of homeless Northern California. Um, but in Mexico City, it was a long night. Oh my God. So, <laughs> very um, long uh, night. Logan, who <laughs> is the most altitude. devious uh, of the yeah. Fox family? I don't know. <laughs> I almost want to say Dina. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say myself. <laughs> like, honestly, the amazing moment. Honest. There's that amazing moment where you're, uh, where you're in the the car and you're looking in the rearview mirror at, at your father being arrested. Um, you, you want to talk a little bit about that scene and that experience and what what's going through uh, Dina's mind at that time? That night was so so wild because it was five in the morning and <laughs> we were trying to <laughs> wrap it up because the sun was going to come up and. Um, it honestly it was one of those moments it was like I had to I had to really force myself to get into the character's mindset because I was just so concerned I mean like I hadn't driven a car recklessly like that before so I was like thinking about okay how am I going to do a hard reverse and then you know get to this um get to the stoplight and drive in a certain way with the camera mounted on the hood like I have a photo and like there's just this camera on the hood like and I can't really see and I remember Rupert going like can you, you sure we can do this I'm like sure being like I don't know actually I'm really freaking scared um but I just wanted to do it because why not um but yeah I mean I, I think it's one of my my favorite moments because it's one of those those pivots with a character where you get to sort of see them evolve like and you don't really know obviously the audience doesn't really know what's going to happen but for me I was excited reading the script seeing that decision being made because it's sort of just that evolution in character and going oh she's not going to go with you know what we think she's going to do the opposite and I mean I was really surprised when I read it in the in the script it completely caught me off guard um, and and to, to, to finish this out, I, I think another moment that um, really sticks with me um, from, from the first episode, uh, Melissa and, and Justin is uh, in that tool shed um, where you're breaking out the plan and, and how you're mm -hmm. going to, um, can, you know, you're at this incredible juncture and, uh, and Margot is, is ready to, to pull the ripcord and call her parents and, and Justin, you're, you're going to take her on a, on a further adventure. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that scene and, and what that emotional journey was like? Well, I, I like seeing Ali at his, he was, it was a weak moment for him and to see them working together on how to get themselves into a better situation. And then you see how pessimistic Margot is. And then, then you can see why she loves Ali so much because of his optimism and his ideas and her eyes start to glimmer when he talks about the trawler and where we're going to go and let's go to Mexico. We're going to, and that's what I love is that sort of ability that Ali has to make sort of Margot open her eyes to life. Whenever I think of that scene, I, I can imagine this couple, I, can, I, I it's sort of, what I like about it, and it's really the writing, I'm not going to take any credit for it, but I think it's, you can imagine them at, you know, whenever they fell in love at age 20 nothing, you know, kind of going, oh my, we're going to do this in our lives. We're going to do this, 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 this. And it sort of harkens back to, you know, and I think it just, it's also just wish fulfillment on, you know, something that we all wish, you know, we could do is like, oh, what if we just, I can just kick the front door open and leave the house and not even pay the electric bill and just set off, mm. you know, and it's that it's a, you know, I've often said one of the things that is true of both of them is that they're optimists, you know, I love this couple's optimism. Yeah, um, me too. It gets tried many times, um, but, uh, and they disagree on things, but all over the writing, I can see their bond, you know, mm. um, and it's sometimes very unspoken and sometimes overt. 
and you know, and it's also kind of one of those moments that, that we talked about earlier, where it's you can see why they're the sort of unrealistic teenagers in the story, and mm. the, the kids are the ones going, "What are we doing?" You know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and you, you kind of they're kind of like that, those annoying, that, you know, hippie. That Bonnie and Clyde with kids, basically. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly <laughs> right. That would be a great film. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, we do. Uh, <laughs> well, it's really amazing to see you all again. Um, it's very cruel not to be able to hug you and, and, and shake your hands. And I'm looking forward to the day that we can do that. Um, thank you for, for gathering and, and, and talking about the adventure of making this show together and um, looking forward to the adventure yet to come. Thank you so much to our cast and our director. I also want to thank our showrunner and executive producer, Neil Cross, who can't be with us today because he's halfway around the world. I also want to thank the author and executive producer, Paul Theroux, as well as executive producers, Ed McDonald, Peter Jason, Bob Bookman, and Alan Gasmer. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the series.